everyone. My name is Corey, and welcome to this week's chapter by chapter recap. We are looking at the Psalms. We are smack dab in the middle of the Psalms. Well, really still in the early parts, but we're getting there. Uh, we are looking at Psalm 50 to Psalm 79. And of course, like always, I'm here with my husband, Matlock. Hey, Matlock. Hey. Hey. How you doing? Good. Are you ready to recap the Psalms? Sort of. I fell sort behind. Of right. Yes. So. This is confession time. This is confession. I fell behind. This is Truth partly, you're partly Matlock, recapping to me as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I ran out of time with all the, my workload this week, so this will be good. It happens. Yeah, that's right. So I know it happens to viewers, too. That's kind of it why happens. we do this. So yeah. I'm in the boat with everyone else. So you're going to be experiencing the recap live as we go. Yes. That's right. <laughs> As yeah, we go, yeah, we're getting recap. you caught up so that you can continue with your <laughs> yeah. reading tomorrow. Okay. All right. Psalm 50. Let's jump right in. Okay. So Psalm 50, God addresses uh, his people in this psalm. And by his people, I mean his covenant people. So Israel and Judah. And he he sets the record straight about sacrifices. So in God's covenant, and when I talk about the covenant, you think about the law, the law of God uh, delivered through Moses. So Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, that really expounds uh, what that law is. So God in this Psalm sets the record straight about sacrifices. This isn't the only place he does it in scripture, but he does do it here. Essentially, God makes it clear that he does not need animal sacrifices. The people aren't doing him some sort of favor. They're not feeding him as they would be feeding an idol or anything of the sort. God makes it clear that all things, including the animal kingdom, already belong to him because he is their creator. Uh, But it does talk about how these sacrifices and, and moving beyond animal sacrifices into offerings as well, it was a way that the people showed their thankfulness to God for who he is and for what he had done for them. And at this point in history, he was known like today, if you talk, if you ask a Christian who God is to them, they would talk about, you know, God being their savior and, and about, you know, the Messiah being Jesus Christ who saved them from their sins and saved them from hell. That would be kind of the epithet that we, that we tag on to God. You know, this God who not only created me, but he saved me from hell and he saved me from my own sin and foolishness. Well, back in the day, back with Israel and Judah, God saved them out of Egypt. That was what he had done for them to kick off their, you know, nationhood, their statehood. He saved them out of Egypt in the Exodus and established them in the promised land in the land of Canaan. So sacrifices and offerings were one of the ways that Israel was to show their thankfulness and their acknowledgement to God based off of what he had done for them. Psalm 51. This is a really interesting one. This is um, a psalm that was written after David had been caught in the affair with Bathsheba. And, And unfortunately, as we all know, it wasn't just an affair. He went to great lengths to cover up the affair. He mur- He had uh, her husband murdered. It was just really rough. He covered up that murder. Um, but when he was ultimately called out on it, he truly repented. And we see that repentance here in Psalm 51. So Psalm 51 acts as a confession to God of David's sin and also a cry for mercy to God. And I think it's really interesting. This is a really famous verse, but I've recently begun thinking about it a little bit differently. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And, you know, I recently did a a six-part Bible study, like a six-series Bible study on Saul that it's going to be coming out soon on Bible discovery uh, um, as a product. But when thinking about David and what he saw firsthand with Saul, Mm. God literally removed his Holy Spirit from King Saul and it drove King Saul mad. And David, you know, David's first interaction with Saul, he got to see what happens to a king when God removes or to a person when God removes his Holy Spirit. And the rest of Saul's life on earth Every interaction that David had with him that's recorded in the Bible, David gets to see this this 
almost split personality, this tormented Saul who has lost, the Holy Spirit has been removed, had been removed from Saul. And right. so when David gets here and, and, and he realizes that he's committed this sin against God and even says, against you and you only have I sinned, he acknowledges it. He says, do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. And I think it's really easy for us not having seen what that looks like yeah. to kind of breeze over this, but recognizing how real that this would have been for David, this removal of the Holy Spirit uh, from the King of Israel, from his life, it brings a new level of understanding that we can have for his desperation here. Yeah, I, I would completely understand. Like it's, in one hand, it's like, when Saul had his, the Holy Spirit removed from him and he was going mad, on one hand, he wanted to kill David, on the other hand, he loved David. Whenever mm -hmm. David would sing songs or hear his voice, he'd, he would, snap, out he'd of snap out of it. It's like just hearing the Spirit through David would revitalize some sort of like <laughs> times of they used to be with the Holy Spirit. Yes. It, it would make him feel better yeah. in his own life. And if you think about that, and and even in the midst of, you know, when, he, when Saul commits that terrible... Um, crime of arrogance by building a victory monument in his name, he's still arrogant with the Holy Spirit. Yes. Right? Yep. And so it's like you have this thing where it's like you could be arrogant with the Spirit, but there's a point where you go too far. Yeah, and you can lose it. And and that's a very scary thing that happens here in the Old Testament. And David knows that that, that you, you, you were saying, he knows that that can happen to him too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and so it makes repentance real for David. It right. makes repentance real and, and, and it makes me it makes me reflect whenever I hit Psalm 51 now, it makes me reflect on how real my repentance is to me. Right. Like am I repenting because I'm told to repent? Or am I or am I repenting because I realize how real this is? Well, well then you see it here, it's summarized at the very end, where David says in verse 16 and 17, for you will not delight in sacrifice mm -hmm. or I would give it. Exactly. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. Yes. So that summarizes it completely. That's actually the whole heart of the New Testament too, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, because because true repentance is what Saul was lacking. That's if right. Saul truly repented, God wouldn't have taken his Holy Spirit. Right. And so we see David in desperation doing the only thing that he knows, like his only chance is repentance. Right. And that is still true today. Yeah. Like our only chance is repentance. Yeah, it reminds me of Peter too. When Peter says, um, you're worse off than you were before. When you, right? When people come to Christ and they leave. Yeah, and, and well, Jesus and, even talks about that in yeah. the Gospels. Yeah, with the, with There's the a whole it's, demons it, it's being a, cast out. Yeah. It's a whole bunch of things in the New Testament. The ring about the people who come to Christ, they taste the Holy Spirit. They, have, right. they, they partake in right, right, right. it and then they leave and they're worse than they were before. I'm not saying that this is a loss of the Holy Spirit, but I, what I am saying is that there's a relationship there of people who come to, have, to taste what God is like and they reject it. Like mm -hmm. Saul rejected it. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's what comes out of it. Mm -hmm. You think about the world where we are today, everyone rejecting God. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I don't know, it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty powerful. There's a pretty powerful, it's clearly written with, with obviously like deeply impacted David's life, everything. There's so many things going on yeah. in Psalm 51. Yeah. You could talk about this for a while. So, yeah, it's, it's very rich. Yeah. All right, so Psalm 52 continues talking about specific events from King David's life. And this one is also a very brutal one. Uh, this is David confronting a man named Doeg the Edomite. And we read about this back in, in um, the books of Samuel, where uh, Doeg... Uh, the Edomite was the chief shepherd of King Saul, and he oversaw, he saw, he he witnessed David going to the priests at Nob, uh, where the tent tabernacle was, for help. And uh, Doeg sells David's location out to Saul, but he also sells out the priests of Nob. And he says, you know, they were helping David, and David was running away from you, even though the priests were innocent. And the result is that Doeg slaughters at the order of Saul, he slaughters the priests of God at Nob, and then he slaughters, he completely destroys the city of Nob. Um, so this is David confronting this evil of Doeg the Edomite. Uh, and, you know, it's really interesting in Psalm 52, he, you know, David asked this question, why do you boast of evil? 
uh, your end is not going to be good. So despite like he Doe got rewarded for selling out David and for murdering the priests of Nob when no one else would in Saul's army, uh, David's like, yeah, you've been rewarded, but you're not, it's not going to go well for you in the end. Um, and, and essentially David then points to God's will for David, which was for good. David knew that he had been anointed king of Israel. It was going to happen regardless of Doeg's evil or not, but Doeg would still be accountable for that evil. So interesting to pair up the Psalms here with the historical narrative. When when the Bible gives us those cues, you know, it's about Doeg the Edomite, go back into Samuel and look up Doeg the Edomite. It's really interesting to see these poetic responses to the history that actually happened. Okay, so Psalm 53, this is almost identical to Psalm 14, which we looked at last week, and it deals with the fate of the foolish man. Uh, so it's probably no surprise, no coincidence that it's after Psalm 52, talking about Doeg. But basically, what makes a man a fool and what happens to that man? Uh, this is where we get the famous, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. So um, again, this psalm is almost a carbon copy of Psalm chapter 14. So it's probably been essentially copied and pasted here after the psalm about Doeg, highlighting the fact that he was foolish and cursed. Okay, Psalm 54 this moves us back into another um, event in David's life, this time when he's sold out by uh, an entire group of people who are actually a part of his tribe, the tribe of Judah. They're called the Ziphites, and they sell out his location to Saul. So this is a cry to God for help, uh, in which David asks, let evil recoil on those who slander me. So they're sending out evil towards me. May it recoil back on them. Psalm 55 Okay, so from Psalm 52 to Psalm 64 uh, that we've looked at and we're going to continue to look at, we're really talking a lot about David's enemies. This is a chunk of Psalms that deal with that. Uh, and sure enough, here in Psalm 55, once again, David has been betrayed. Uh, verses 20 to 21 talk about that. He says, if an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe were rising against me, I could hide. But it is you a man like myself, my companion, my close friend with whom I uh, once enjoyed sweet fellowship at the house of God as we walked among the worshipers. So here again, David is being betrayed not only by, a, by close friends and confidants, but by people who also serve the Lord or at least did at one point. Um, you know, David ends up concluding this psalm with the only with his message that he'll say over and over again. His conclusion is that the only one that you can really trust is God. Verses 22 to 23 says this, cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken, but you God will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The bloodthirsty and deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. So David recognizes here that no matter what it feels like in his life at the moment, no matter what it looks like physically is going on, no matter who is currently succeeding and who is currently failing, ultimately God's justice in the end will, will come to pass, whether that's in this life or the next. Uh, and David is going to choose to trust God regardless of what he sees. And, and yeah, and on that note of this life or the next, with the next life, David's specifically highlighting the difference between it what it means to be good and evil mm -hmm. and what how that pertains to your rewards in the afterlife. So for example, verse 15, let death steal over them. Let them go down to Sheol alive for evil is in their dwelling place and in their heart, mm -hmm. their secret dwelling place. Mm -hmm. like with their inner being is evil. This idea of going to Sheol alive mm -hmm. is something that people often say, oh, it's a New Testament invention. This is something David's just saying here that later on, like you already said, will cast him down to the pit of destruction. Yeah. Sheol alive. Yeah. But specifically what he, what happens here, what he's contrasting here is that these the people who go to Sheol alive or that should go to Sheol alive is what David's saying, are people who reject goodness. They are literally, I know in our culture we have this idea that humans are inherently good. It's like that's not what's happening. Mm -hmm. That's not a picture that's painted here at all in the text. 
and like nowhere it's like our humans just inherently good and we're all just doing the right thing we're all just miscommunicating it's all just mistake <laughs> right it's like no it's like there are people who are doing explicit evil and we and we have iniquity deceit in our hearts the idea here is that when you actually want what's good if you want true goodness truth goodness righteousness justice you want these things you will find god mm. that's the idea and god will spare you but those who don't want it there's for the pit of destruction. Therefore, mm-hmm. and you know, he even says here, let them go down to Sheol alive. Like that's a, that's a powerful statement here. Yeah, it is. Right? And especially in the Psalms. Um, so it's something to keep an eye here because it's it's this isn't your type of, oh, you're Joe Schmo on the street. You really don't know who he is and you make up this life. Well, he probably is a nice guy. And it's like, yeah. It's not like this at all. It's like you're purposely pushing all that is good out of the way mm-hmm. to live your own life however you see fit. Mm-hmm. Right? All right, so Psalm 56. Now, this Psalm, again, we're going to continue talking about the enemies of David until about Psalm 64. This uh, Psalm was written as a response to when, do you remember when David fled to Gath, which is a Philistine city, and he thought he could go unnoticed, but they recognized him, and so they brought him before the king of Gath, and David, to get out of it, acted like he had lost his mind, like he acted like he had lost his sanity. Um that was in 1 Samuel chapter 21. So essentially, Psalm 56 is written as a result of this uh, episode. And it's a psalm about trusting God Well, you are in a place of great fear uh, and how David will praise God coming you know, in and out of situations like that. Psalm 57, This uh, we're told this is when David had fled from Saul into a cave. So this is that time where he's in, he's in the wilderness, hiding from Saul all the time, you know, jumping from spot to spot. The theme here uh, is very appropriate. As David is taking refuge in a physical cave, he's, the theme here is that God is actually his refuge. So he might be taking refuge in nature, but in reality, God is his actual refuge. Um, it's really cool because we, uh, I mentioned this last year too, but verse eight is really neat. It it goes, awake my soul, awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. And, And we just get this, this visual picture of David struggling to sleep, you know, as he's being hunted, he's struggling to sleep here in, in the cave, but he, is really determined to trust God and praise him. So Mm -hmm. like, wake up my soul, wake up harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. So he's calling himself to make music to God. Um, Not only is he going to awaken the dawn, he's literally going to praise in the morning, uh, but he believes that that morning, that dawn is going to bring his deliverance, Mm -hmm. which is really cool. Psalm 58, Um, this is a a cry for God to bring judgment on unjust human judges who, for all intents and purposes, seem to be doing great. So even though they are unjust judges, which is the worst thing you can be as a judge, um, they seem to be getting along just fine. So David is calling out on God to bring judgment on them. Uh, They're called enemies of mankind and they're compared to venomous snakes who cannot be charmed because they've plugged their ears so they can't hear the charmer's music. Sounds a lot like the New Testament. Yep. And they're also, they're also compared to lions and archers. Um, There's also some really, really fun imagery in here. Uh, David says, and again, I brought this up last year because I just think it's so fun. Uh, May they be like a slug that melts away as it moves along. (laughs) He's just like, let them spend their life. I I mean, yeah. Yeah. It it looks like a slug is melting away because it leaves the trail of slime. So eventually it will wear itself out. So that's what God, that's what David is praying. Like let them wear themselves out. Um, It's David's hope essentially that they will spend themselves up and and just, just them leaving evilly will eventually destroy them. Mm. 
Psalm 59, this is all about God as a fortress again. David loves this theme probably because he needed a lot of fortresses to save him from his enemies and his enemies were attacking him once again. Uh, David says of these enemies, they return at evening snarling like dogs and they prowl about the city. So wild dogs in the ancient world are were a documented problem where there'd be these packs of wild dogs that would come in at nighttime and uh, it was really a dangerous thing. He continues, they wander about for food and howl if not satisfied, but I will sing of your strength. In the morning, I will sing of your love for you are my fortress, my refuge in times of trouble. So he contrasts here the howling of his enemies. You know, your howling is like a wild dog. It's like a wild animal. Uh, But I will make my voice sing praises to God. Mm. Psalm 60, this is another teaching psalm. Uh, it's it's related to the time where David fought Aram, Nariam, and Aram Zobah. Uh, and when Joab returned and struck down 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. That's what the, su- the subscript will say. Um, so again, this is a reference to 2 Samuel chapter 8, when Israel fought the Philistines, the Edomites, and the Moabites. So it opens with a statement of rejection. You have rejected us, God, and and the proof of this is because our enemies are attacking us and it's, it's going very bad. Then there's this declaration of God's victory over Israel's enemy, and there's this assurance that everyone who loves God truly will be saved. And it ends with another plea, um, that the people need God. They right. don't need a mercenary army. They don't need another nation to help, but they need God's help whatever way he wants to do that. Psalm 61, uh, David has found himself weak and in trouble and far away from the sanctuary of God, but he wants to live long enough to go back and praise God at God's sanctuary. So it's this, this, he's crying out to God to extend his life. In Psalm 62, again, we've got this this theme of God as a refuge, as a place of rest for David, even in the face of very real enemies. Uh, Verses three to eight say this, how long will you assault me? Would all of you throw me down this leaning wall, this tottering fence? Surely they intend to topple me from my lofty place. They take delight in lies. With their mouths they bless, but in their hearts they curse. So David in a very weakened state is enemies are still coming against him. Continuing on here, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock, my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him, for God is our refuge. I think that's really interesting. It's not, I think sometimes we have this this idea that if we apply our faith like a bandage, if we say, here's how I'm feeling, but here's what I know to be true. In our culture today, some people would say that feels like denying our truth. Mm -hmm. Like I have a truth that I'm broken. So talking about things that I know, like God is faithful, God is my refuge, God is my strength, that to them, they're like, that's just denying your truth. No, 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 no. (laughs) What it is, what it is, is pouring out your heart. You can pour out your heart to God. That's what David has been doing in all of these Psalms. And he literally says here in verse eight, pour out your hearts to him, (coughs) to God, uh, for God is our refuge. So vent to God, tell him what you're going through, tell him how you feel, but you need to make sure at the end that you're reminding yourself, you're reminding your soul, you're reminding your heart what it is that God has already taught you about himself, that he is faithful, that he has saved you from your sin, that he has saved you from hell, that ultimately he is the judge of all. He brings justice and this world is not the end, Mm. right? So there's a higher hope, a deeper hope that we cling to. Yeah, it's beautiful. It is, it is a beautiful thing. Psalm 63, uh, David praises God in a desert, a literal desert, not like I'm feeling like I'm in a desert right now, which I mean, that that does happen. But David is in a literal desert at this point. Uh, it does. This psalm obviously does work metaphorically as well, but it's 
it's nice to know that it was that it was actual. <laughs> <laughs> he wasn't just saying, I, yeah. I feel like I'm going to do this. No, he, yeah. he was in one. Uh, but he does turn it around uh, and, and he turns the physical complications of being in a desert and he uses them spiritually. In verse one, he says, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Right. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So he's taking his surroundings and he's applying it spiritually. So just as I'm thirsty, my body really needs water. I actually, my, my whole being needs you like my body needs water. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's really cool. There's a lot of different things like that that he does yeah, in this psalm good. comparing the wilderness to... Yeah, they always use the, the physical things to point to the spiritual things. Absolutely. So this, what's interesting about that is that the physical things are a reflection or a symbol of yeah. the spiritual, whereas a lot of other religions actually reverse that. Yes. Right? Where the, where the, the spiritual things are a reflection or symbol of the physical. Mm-hmm. So it's like you have like this complete different way of looking at things. And there's some people who might even make this like, oh, it's just metaphor. And that m- metaphor is one thing where it's like a like, metaphor is great for just understanding the depth of, let's say, um, how something works in a very rational, systematic way or just the nature of someone's soul or whatever it is. It's very, but when it comes to symbolism, it's very real. Mm-hmm. There's a there's a spiritual reality to symbolism, which is different from metaphor. Yes. Metaphor is limited to your mental Agreed. faculties. But in this case, it's it's something much more. Anyways. Okay, so Psalm 64 is all about the enemies of David and how how they work. So how they're plotting injustice and, and planning it out, planning evil, and how God will, David believes that God will eventually turn their own plans on their head. Psalm 65, this is a song about how God blesses the whole world because he created the whole world. He's over the whole world. Um Uh, He's called the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. And um, David says, to you, all people will come. Psalm 66, um, this, this theme of God being the God of all humanity, of all people, continues, um, and all people are encouraged to praise God. Uh, This is the shout for joy to God, all the earth psalm. In Psalm 67, this is about the mission of that Israel has been given by God to be priests of the world, to sort of uh, initiate or mediate a relationship between all people, the other nations, and God. Uh, going, it, it, it harkens back to the original promise that God gave to Abraham uh, back in Genesis. So the Abrahamic covenant uh, is how we refer to it. Uh, But in that covenant, God tells Abraham that through him, all nations would be blessed. Uh, Psalm 68. uh, This is a little bit of a longer Psalm uh, and it, and it speaks about God using symbolic language. Uh, It talks about how God rescued Israel out of slavery in Egypt and how he settled them in Zion, uh, that is Jerusalem. Um, This seems to be David looking at the progression of Israelite history, which was really common from the Exodus to his own time, uh, looking at it from the presence of God. And, And this is significant because the the physical item that represented the presence of God, which was the Ark of the Covenant, it got a new home specially made for it in Jerusalem. It was just a tent home at the time with David, but at at this time. So it's possible, it is possible that Psalm 68, when you read it, could have been created to sing at this procession Mm. of the Ark of the Covenant coming to Jerusalem because it's all about Israel coming out of Exodus, coming out of Egypt in the Exodus and going to Mount Zion in Jerusalem. So it it would have been a very cool thing to sing while the Ark of the Covenant was coming uh, to Jerusalem. Okay, Psalm 69, um, David wrote this song, we are told, in a time of really great distress while he was waiting and hoping for God's salvation. Psalm 70 is another really quick uh, prayer for help, just a few verses. Uh, Psalm 71 uh, is written from an elderly perspective. So it's looking back on an older person looking back on the days when they were young. Uh, There's 
the very middle verse of the psalm really highlights the theme for us. As for me, I will always have hope. I will praise you more and more. So this person's life experiences have just led them to trust God more and more uh, and to hope in him no matter what. Psalm 72 is attributed to David's son, King Solomon. And basically, this is a prayer that Solomon wrote for himself. Uh, basically, there some of the requests are that he would be able to fulfill his role as judge of the people with God's justice and righteousness. Um, you know, he... he he wanted to be able to be a good king for Israel. And that's reflected in Psalm 72. Uh, but um, even though it was attributed to King Solomon, there is a messianic element in this psalm as well. Uh, it can be applied very easily to the Messiah. This, this promised branch that's going to come out of the family of David to rule eternally because there is some um, eternal language that goes on in Psalm 72. So if you're interested in that, check it out. Psalm 73 begins the collection three that's probably labeled as book three in your English translations of the Bible. So this is this goes from Psalm 73 to Psalm 89. Um, and most of these psalms in book three have to do with times of crisis. So it's going to be really interesting. Psalm 73 talks about an internal crisis. So the writer thinks about the prosperity of the wicked, how God's not, he's just allowing all these wicked people to prosper and how the psalmist almost lost his way because he he envied these wicked people. They are not trying at all to live moral lives and they are living better than me physically, financially, things like that. Um, so this psalmist questioned whether or not he was literally wasting his life trying to follow God, but he comes to his senses when he goes to the temple and he begins to contemplate eternity because there is another world after this one. And he comes to the conclusion that God is better than wealth. In Psalm 74, we see uh, the psalmist mourning over the destruction of the Jerusalem temple by Babylon. So we've jumped time periods now. We are looking at the the time period after the Babylonian exile. Um, And it's a call for God to remember the people of Israel and to restore Judah and Jerusalem specifically. Psalm 75, this is all about how God will answer the unrighteous as well. So how in the end of all things, God will bring everything into his righteous judgment. Um, Psalm 76, this continues a theme that we've we've seen a little bit already of God as conqueror. Uh, and this seems to continue to answer the the questions left by the catastrophe of the Babylonian destruction of the temple that we read about in Psalm 74. So the message basically of Psalm 76 is ultimately God is the one who is in control. It's not invading armies. It's not the wicked. It's not even the righteous. It's God who is in control and he alone is to be feared and followed. Few more chapters here to wrap up the week. Psalm 77, this takes us on like an internal journey, for lack of a better word, of wrestling with crisis. So we see the psalmist talk about how they are in agony and and distress, unable to sleep. Um, They're remembering all of the things that God used to do in Israel's history, but they're not seeing today. Um, They conclude by saying, you know, I will meditate on your mighty deeds. I will seek comfort in what I know about God to be true rather than just sitting here wasting away in my current situation because this is not helping me. It is it is agonizing. Psalm 78, um, it's re- it reviews a lot of the history of Israel. So it, it meshes really well because Psalm 77, the person mentions that while they are currently in agony, they're going to remember God's mighty deeds. And then Psalm 78 talks about God's mighty deeds and acts. Uh, 
Psalm 79, this is the last chapter that we're going to look at today. It again jumps forward to the time period of the Babylonian exile after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple of God in Jerusalem. The people here acknowledge their sin in not following God, and they they are asking for God to save them and to reverse their fortunes, essentially to reverse the Babylonian exile and to bring punishment to their enemies who wrought such destruction. So there we are. Book three is is all about crisis again. So it's it's yeah. it's a lot of the psalms that are sad, but it's really yeah. interesting to see how people deal, how people who were faithful to God dealt with times of great crisis, both internal and external. Yeah, it's important. Yeah. Yeah. Anything to add before we wrap up this week? Uh, no, I was a couple of spots. I was like, oh, actually, I have something to say here, but you should have you know, jumped in. I know I kind of missed my opportunity, but you know what? I actually was reading them all. I almost, almost read them all. I got up to seventy. Well, I was recapping. To, yes, I got up to seventy-seven, <laughs> and then I lost. Then I couldn't. I didn't make it. But I was, I was racing. Yeah, I was trying to see if I could make it. Well, but yeah, I lost. I, I cut out a lot. I just, I just did recaps, <laughs> man. So I'm impressed that you got as far as you did. All right. Well, I'm impressed. Yeah, it was good. All right, guys, leave your comments and questions below. I hope you have a good week, and we'll see you next time. Thank you so much for watching. We want to keep producing high quality biblical content, but we can't do it without your support. If you feel called to support us, please click the link in the description under donate. Your support really means a lot to us.